Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thanks, Dr. Hofstetter and Seattle Science Foundation for having us. We're um, going to do a cervical um, posterior um, frame anatomy here at the endoscope. And um, first thing to note is um, just that there's a, a couple of different ways I think that you've probably already heard about to um, get the case started, figure out where you're going to make your incision, figure out where you're going to dock. Um, you know, there's certain landmarks that I think are universal to approach. Um, what I like to think about is converting this to the same uh, sequence of steps that I use for a lot of different other procedures. So I'll do almost every case um, by starting on the inferior lip of the lamina um, of the target level. So, you know, my, one of my first goals in doing this case is to just feel that familiar landmark, rubbing my um, initial dilator along the inferior lip of the superior lamina, and then working my way out um, to the keyhole and the joint. And we'll kind of walk you through the whole process. But before we do that, I'm telling you that because it plays into how I, I target things on x-ray here. Um, before that, we'll, we'll just take a couple of shots. Um, start off with an AP here. Now what we're looking for is the little uh, Y, the keyhole, whatever um, terminology that you've heard. But basically, um, the joint, the beginning of the joint, where it transitions into joint from the, the lamina and the lateral mass. Um, that's really going to be the target of your drilling, and that's where you want to center your, um, you know, your fluoroscopic approach over. So that's, uh, that's a nice AP. Can we come back to um, a lateral here? I was talking a little bit yesterday about why I navigate these in my home institution, and it's because I like to have the um, security of knowing exactly where I am as I'm dilating down through muscle, through fascia, and um, into um, the bony space over the cord. And um, so one of the keys to making me feel safe as I do this is I make a little bit of a bigger incision probably than I need, and I'll make a bigger incision through the fascia than I probably need, because what I like to do is kind of a windshield wiper movement with my initial dilator down. Um, until I feel like I'm on that inferior lip of the lamina. And I feel like I'm on bone, and I feel um, like I'm getting out onto facet. So I'm kind of constantly scraping along the bone with the uh, initial dilator to make sure that I really feel like I know where I am. I can make out of my, my topographic landmarks, and, um, and I feel safe that I'm not getting too deep and getting into the, the canal and, and potentially damaging the cord. Um, so you can take sequential shots as you progress through that, um, um, you know, the series of layers of soft tissue, or if you're going to plan on navigating this, you can just kind of follow as you go. So I've got my initial dilator in there. I feel like I'm on bone. I'm scraping, and I feel like I'm um, where I want to be. I can make out all the kind of the, the topographic landmarks, and I'm just going to start using my dilators here. Same as an interlaminar approach. And there are you know, different surgeons uh, like to, to approach the disc space uh, using different angles. So some uh, like to start lower and aim up, uh, you know, similar to the angle of where the inner uh, spinous, or the, between the spinous processes, so being parallel with them. Um, that minimizes the amount of bone that you have to remove. Some people like to be, so, you know, Dr. McGrath is a, because you can see starting lower and going higher. Uh, but some people like to be more straight on, and, and Dr. Derman, who you'll hear from later today, um, you, you know, likes to do that. And there are benefits of, of either uh, approach, and I'll, we'll talk about that, those later. Can you just take another lateral shot here? Okay, great. So yeah, our target level is three, four here. Everything is looking pretty good. I'm going to take out the dilators. Here you go. Just give me a little bit of slack there on the... Uh, Camera, thank you. And can so, I just have you? So move Lynn, you want to tell us a couple of tricks how to, you know, facilitate that transition a bit more. from Lynn? Can you hear me? Perfect, thank you. Uh, no, uh, very muffled, Christoph. I think that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Hey, can you tell us a little bit about the how to facilitate the transition from palpation to visualization? You know, what do you do in order to recognize, you know, get those bony structures that appear magically in your screen here right now? Um, you know, what do you do to facilitate that? Um, 
uh, you know, I use, so I get, but the very first thing I do to facilitate that is I, I, with my initial dilator, I'm scraping along the bony anatomy, the bony landmarks as much as possible to try to start to clear out the soft tissue uh, before I even get in um, with the camera. And I do that with each, uh, you know, sequential dilator. I'll, I'll scrape along the bone. I will try to do as much of the soft tissue uh, you know, clearance with the, the dilator and then eventually with the working channel um, as, I'm, as I'm dilating, as I'm going. By the time I, I am ready to bring in the scope, hopefully a lot of that soft tissue dissection is done and I'm looking at bone as I bring my scope in, which you know, is, is the case here. I can, I can kind of see some of the bony landmarks here um, and I start to clean that up. You know, there's always gonna be a little bit of muscle creep. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of soft tissue left on there, and I, I just will, I'll clear that off with, um, you know, my cautery here, and um, you know, using cautery, using a little bit of the scissor, the pituitary, is nice. And you know, the goal here is, is, is not to expose every little thing that I'm I'm uh, I'm not going to plan on operating on everything that I'm seeing here. My goal is to make myself feel comfortable that I've exposed enough bony anatomy to know where I am and use those bony landmarks as my, as my guide. Lynn, can you, can you point out that V that we always talk about um, in, in this posterior procedure? Yeah, uh, so I think I'm kind of right over. This cadaver's falling apart a little bit here. Um, but you can see the, the parts moving. You can see the, you know, the lamina turning into the letter mass. You can see the, the joints sort of forming as we go out. Let me see if I can clear that up a little bit more. But, Kind of right in the center of the screen there is what I would consider that V and where I would where I would plan to start drilling. Yeah, you can see that V right there. Yeah, if you point it out. Yeah, yeah there it is. Osama, you're going to say something. Yeah, so, and the thing is, is even if you veer off more more medial or more lateral, eventually you'll get to where you need to be. So sometimes the V uh, point is is difficult to see because of tissue um, or because of overgrown uh, joints. So uh, that's a nice thing. The drill isn't just for bone. It's, it's a, at least the, the system that we have here, it's a shrill. It drills soft tissue as well. So as long as you are, are comfortable with where we are, and you, know, you can always do an AP uh, and lateral x-ray, obviously, to, to make sure that you're in the right place. Um, and when you, you know, if you're pretty confident, then you can start drilling and everything will kind of come into place. Yeah, if I'm ever unsure about where I am, I'll usually um, default by going a little bit more medial and just getting that familiar feeling of kind of falling off the inferior lip of the lamina, making sure that I, I really know that I'm there, and then I can kind of work my out, way out laterally from there if I, if I just want to kind of find home and, and make sure I know where I am. I'll take the drill. So wh while you start drilling and preparing, uh, you guys want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the lateral trajectory. I know that Christoph describes kind of splitting between the, the inclination of the facet joint and the disc space and kind of immediate and kind of getting in between that angle. But I've also seen people just go directly in the disc space. I mean, is there any particular um, uh, method you guys prefer? Uh, so, so, so from my standpoint, I think either one works, obviously. The, the benefit of doing it uh, the way you know, that you describe uh, with Christoph is that I think you minimize the bony removal. I think it makes it a lot faster. Um, the, I think the detriment, at least to me, um, is that when you're, because uh, at the end of the day, you, what you want to see, you want to see the lateral edge of the fecal sac, you want to see the nerve root coming out, uh, and then you want to make sure that you're just distal to the pedicles, uh, the, the, pro, the, um, uh, the, the proximal, or the, the caudal pedicle and the cranial pedicle. Um, and I feel like if you go from inferior to superior, you minimize the, the bony removal, but you really the can't pressure. see the inferior pedicle. Um, you see the superior one really, really well, uh, and you can make sure that you're just lateral to that. Um, but the inferior pedicle, you, you palpate it, but you can't really see it as well, at least uh, from what I've seen. Um, the way that you know, Dr. Derman will talk about later today, which is kind of more uh, perpendicular or parallel with the disc space, you're able to palpate both the upper and the lower pedicle. Um, and I think for someone who's just starting, you know, even though you have to remove more bone, it might make it more similar to what you do with the tube now. So it might make it better in terms of the, um, the, the learning curve, in my opinion. So 
Perfect. Thanks, Osama. Uh, you know, Lynn, um, you know, tell us a little bit about what you're paying attention to here right now, because, you you know, like Osama, you know, I think you made a really good point that the drill is not only to resect bone, but also to expose anatomy to better understand it. So one thing is why you do this drilling right now. You're obviously exploring right now, and you're paying close attention to how thick the lamina is, right? The, the lamina in the cervical spine is typically not very thick. So if you start drilling very deep holes in bones, you're typically lost in the spinous process, right? Um, and so then you want to, you know, raise your hand a little bit and go a little bit more lateral. And it's super easy because the scope and everything sort of like, you know, pulls you out. Uh, so whenever, you know, this becomes very, very thick, you know, you drill a lot, then you're typically, you know, typically in the spinous process, you can also be, you know, in the, um, in, in the in the in the facet joint. You see that on the lateral aspect right now, you're drilling right now, it's much, much thinner. You see it, Lynn? Um, exactly, yeah. And uh, it's very easy to, to just drill, drill, drill through the spinous process, and you kind of have to, um, you know, do reality checks once in a while. And I've actually drilled through the spinous process and gotten into muscle, and it wasn't until I got into the muscle on the other side that I realized, oh, gee, I'm, I'm, I'm just way too, I'm looking way too far forward in my trajectory here, and, you know, I got to, I got to correct it downwards. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. You got to be constantly kind of doing reality checks and making sure that you, um, you know, you're getting the feedback, the sensation, the sequence that uh, that you want. Yeah, I think Lynn brings up a, a, another point. So another approach that, you know, it's a similar starting point is doing the uh, unilateral laminotomy for bilateral decompression, just like what you're doing in the lumbar spine. That's very possible to do in the cervical spine. I think that's one thing that endoscopy, you know, separates itself uh, from, from doing, uh, you know, open procedures. So not many people do open laminectomies only without instrumentation due to the high risk of post-laminectomy kyphosis. But with endoscopy, you know, we're doing a foraminotomy today, but if you, you can just imagine, instead of going lateral, if you go more medial, you could really do a, a cervical laminectomy with a really you know, nice job of decompressing the canal if the stenosis was more caused by ligamentous hypertrophy. Um, and that's a way to really minimize uh, morbidity for patients. And you know, definitely started fusing less people um, in the cervical spine because of the, 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 um, the knowledge of, of how to do the ULBD uh, in the cervical spine. And you could do that over multiple levels too, sometimes through the same incision. So it's a really slick procedure uh, that can help with, with the treating uh, stenosis with myelopathy. 100%. I've, I've, I've stopped, well, I still do a lot of ACDFs, but I, I, I've, I would say I do many fewer ACDFs uh, as a result of kind of incorporating this into my practice than I would otherwise. And um, I, I think the patients, especially young patients, you know, uh, that are active, I think they really appreciate the fact that there's something else available that doesn't involve a fusion. Can so, Lynn, do you want to, uh, you know, show right now? You, because right now it becomes very obvious and nice to look at the thickness of the bone here right now, lateral and, and medial. You want to point that out? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously you can start to see we're getting to the soft tissue probably um, down there. You, you can see, you know, it's going to be a, a progression as you get more and more lateral. Um, let me just clear so, up some of So this. just to get everyone oriented, do you mind just kind of using your, uh, your probe and just kind of pointing that what you're looking at so that the, the audience kind of knows? Well, we know what you're looking at, but just to, to make it easier for the audience. Yeah, so this is, um, you know, on the right side of the screen here, this is uh, cranial, caudal, um, medial. I initially was palpating the inferior lip of the superior lamina up there, and I I start to drill the, the keyhole, you know, the convergence where the facet begins, where the joint begins. And I'm, I'm slowly drilling from medial to lateral um, and trying to center my drilling over the course, the trajectory of the nerve root, which should be kind of under where I'm looking at right now and, and um, you know, kind of coursing out underneath the joint here. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does, Lynn. Um, you know, obviously this is all sort of uh, dynamic type of surgery, so the, the orientation will change. But as we're looking at it now, just to get folks oriented, it's, you know, 11 o'clock is more medial, you know, 1 or 2 o'clock is more rostral. And then, uh, you know, towards us at 6 o'clock is, is more lateral. Would you agree based on how you're holding out the scope right now? Exactly right. Yeah, 6 o'clock is lateral here. And... Um, 
you know, yeah, one of the one of the most difficult things I think is to just kind of keep track of, of how the camera's moving around all the time when you're just an observer. It makes a lot more sense when you're doing the surgery um, and you're the one controlling it. When you're just observing, it's it's not that easy to keep track of what what's up and what's down. But we're just going to start keeping uh, making progress here, going lateral. And you're just looking for the lateral edge of the fecal sac. Um, yeah, we're looking for the lateral edge of the fecal sac, which I think is, is, you know, sort of coming into view here. I've got to do a little bit of cleaning up, but I think we'll be seeing that soon. So you can see if you go more lateral, you're doing a foraminotomy. If you go more medial, you're doing a laminectomy. Um, and it just depends, again, on what the goals of the procedure are. Uh, is it, you know, is it ligamentous hypertrophy, myelopathy? Is it radiculopathy? And, and uh, you know, like uh, Lynn was saying, I think um, this has definitely minimized the number of fusions uh, being done, which is great. So, um, you know, some people do this bilaterally. If someone has bilateral symptoms, multi-level, um, those are all possibilities that you could do once you're able to, to learn this and, um, and you know, get, get efficient at it. It's a very fast procedure. Um, you know, within 45 minutes, hour, assuming there's not much bleeding, uh, you know, surgeons are usually done with this procedure. And, um, and it's nice because you can really check and see uh, that you're completely decompressed uh, in the correct areas. Have you done any, um, you know, like disc herniations from the posterior approach? Christoph, is that something you started to do? I had a calcified disc herniation um, and kind of a, an osteophyte that um, I thought would have been really difficult to get with an ACDF trying to get a curette or something to kind of break the, the osteophyte off. But it was actually very, it was very simple to do with this approach, um, just kind of opening up the, the neural frame and then kind of finding a space around the nerve root to go and, and, and get a disc herniation that was behind it. Yeah, I think, Lynn, you're bringing up a lot of really good points. Um, you know, I, personally, I'm still struggling with exactly the indication and when not to do it and when to do a foraminotomy. Um, you know, when patients have really severe vertical foramal stenosis with the pedicles being, pedicle to pedicle being very collapsed, even though you can resect some of the inferior pedicle, you know, some of these patients, you know, don't get much better. Um, it's also difficult when patients have severe motor impairment uh, as the ventral aspect of the root is compromised. Um, and I, like what you said is, do you really want to go through the ankle of the depot joint there? Uh, you can mobilize the nerve root, but that causes often a lot of post-operative paresthesias. So yeah, I think the, the balance between doing an ACDF or disc arthroplasty and a post-hysterical foraminotomy for, my, for myself is not entirely clear yet in, in some cases. Uh, <coughs> any other comments? In, here is a lot of experienced surgeons. What do you guys... I, I think one thing that I noticed, that if you have really far lateral, um, you know, stenosis, I don't think the the foraminal, the you can really get the stenosis if it's really far lateral. Um, I've had a patient who, you know, got maybe seventy percent better, but I, but I got a repeat MRI, and it's just you you can't get that far lateral without doing an ACDF or a dish replacement. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, you you want to look at your MRI and see where your pedicles are. Uh, because lateral to where those pedicles are, if there's still stenosis out there, then uh, this procedure won't be adequate. Either you need indirect decompression, um, or you need to do a complete facetectomy, which you know, which you know, most say would require a fusion um, as well. Um, and and you going going back to Christoph's point, I mean, there are a lot of uh, surgeons who are drilling a lot of the pedicle down to give you that vertical height. Um, I haven't done it, but uh, I, I know that very. Uh, you know, very prominent surgeons have, have done that and have had uh, good results with that. Because that's the thing about endoscopy, you c it's very, very uh, focal, it's like, a, it's like a laser. So you really, if you think you need to make the interpedicle distance larger, you could do that, you could drill that down. If you wanna do a discectomy, a lot of times you have to drill a lot, you know, some of the pedicle down to be able to, to get your instruments ventral to the nerve root. So um, you know, not every foraminotomy uh, is the same, it just depends on what your lesion is and what you're going for. Took the I'm trying, there's always going to be some like, soft tissue over the nerve root that's going to kind of obscure your view of it. I'm going to try to peel some of that off so that you can, you can see all the neural elements here. What about one thing I struggled with early um, when I started doing these was if someone has you know, purely foraminal stenosis, just a little bit of slack on the, on the drill here, purely foraminal stenosis, and it would be a good you know, case for a foraminotomy, but they have 
weakness. It took me a while to get my, my head around the idea that you can decompress enough um, in someone with weakness that you'll feel good after the surgery that you didn't leave anything on the table, that you, you really did decompress as much as they needed, and, um, and that you can treat someone with weakness and not just pain with a pheromonotomy. And now I, and now I do it all the time. Is that, is that something you think about, um, Christoph, Osama, you know, treating patients that have weakness with this versus doing an ACDF? I, mean, I, think, I think if, sorry, go ahead, Christoph. You know, if patients have profound weakness, you know, if we have a large ventral pathology, like an oncovertebral, you know, joint, uh, you know, osteophyte, um, I think you should probably consider an ACDF and more tending towards that. Uh, if they have mild weakness and, and, you know, the pedicle to pedicle distance is okay, um, I, I like to do the foraminotomy. Um, but it's, it's very, again, I don't have any, any, any strict sort of parameters for that yet, so, you know, Absolutely, I, I agree. Uh, same, same thing. I think you know when someone yeah. has weakness, I like to be as aggressive as possible to um, to get that back. And I think it just depends on where the pathology is. If it's ventral or if it's uh, if it's dorsal, for sure. Um, and one thing that's really in you know, interesting about doing this endoscopically. So whenever you're doing this with a tube or doing an open, you know, you, you see the, the kind of the two um, parts of the nerve root, the, the ventral um, motor, and then the dorsal sensory. Uh, with the endoscope, I feel like it's even more prominent. You really see them as two separate structures. Um, and that could get very confusing. If you're going for a disc, just make sure that you're not going through the ventral route. You know, because it's really, I mean, you see it with the microscope, but uh, with the endoscope, you really, it looks like a, a huge bulge, and, and you could definitely very easily mistake it with a, um, with a, a disc. Um, and if you're ever unsure, uh, you know, I think finding the lateral edge of the thecal like sac and sliding, you know, kind of some kind of upgoing instrument there and sliding it, um, you know, laterally into the foramen uh, can help you check and see is that nerve root or is that disc. If it's nerve root, then, you know, you're going to be underneath it. If it's disc, then you're going to be above it. So that's kind of a way to check because, again, it's very, very, uh, I mean, sometimes that ventral root is, looks huge and it looks like a disc, especially if it's kind of pushed up at you. You might just come in and we'll take a shot just to kind of give an idea of the progress we're making while we're standing here. So while, while you get an extra, Sam, you talked about, you know, the ULBD cervical. Uh, I think that, is there a point where you, you say, I, you know, it's, it's too many levels? I mean, is it, I know I typically do them for one levels, you know, maybe two levels, but I mean, when it comes to three levels, are you just going to say, hey, I, I think I'm going to have to do traditional here, or is, uh, what goes through your head when you're seeing some of these patients? And I think, I think that's a, that's a, a great, uh, you know, question. I, so I'm the same way. I think two levels, I do it with the endoscope. If it's more than that, then I feel like um, I, I'd go more to doing uh, laminoplasties. So just open cervical laminoplasties. Um, uh, but yeah, so for me, it's two levels. Just again, because of timing. I mean, I know like, probably if, if someone can get this done faster, then maybe it's best to do three levels with the endoscope. But, but at least in my hands, I switch from endoscopic to doing a laminoplasty after two levels, just to the, the time, meaning like the risk benefit um, ratio um, or decision making for me goes more towards the more traditional methods. Yeah, so actually interesting, Osama, the, the, the laminoplasty in my practice, because they all need fusion surgeries eventually, uh, I, I just stopped almost doing them. Uh, but instead, I, I do up to three levels cervical, mm -hmm. you know, lamis, because they're so much faster than the lumbar lamis, because so much less to do. Absolutely. Um, so, Lynn, have you found the uh, inferior index level pedicle there? It looks like you're drilling right on it, right? It's right at, right, exactly, you seem to be right close to it right now, right? This seems to be the pedicle. That's right, yeah. And actually, let's just, um, let's do an AP real quick. Yeah. Look at you. I, I think from a technical safety standpoint, we should point out to the learners how Lynn is holding the drill, too, because he's actually got his... Uh, fingers uh, protecting himself from plunging with the drill, and he's not really applying any downward uh, pressure, which I think, you know, when you're first grabbing the drill, it's not something that, that you, you think about. Yeah, absolutely, that's a great point. I think that's even more critical when you're doing the ULBD and the cervical spine. I mean, that's a case that, um, you know, I, I still have not allowed any residents to do because I'm just, you know, that's, that's very high level because a plunge there, you know, obviously has devastating consequences. So I think. 
being Come comfortable with the drill and being comfortable that you're not plunging, yeah. is, that not, you're not going to plunge is good. Um, you know, also something that you've noticed here is, you know, any time that, you know, you're going in with an instrument, you want to try uh, to be on top of bone, especially if you're doing a ULBD. So you want to kind of move your scope onto a bony area. If you're not confident, get your like instrument in there to the depth that you the want it to kerosene. be in and then move right. back to the where uh, you're, um, you know, where you're working. Yeah. Um, and then going back to the ULBD while, while Lynn's finishing up here, you know, I think a lot of times you don't really have to go that far out on the other side. Um, so anytime that you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm really pushing this, I'm putting pressure on the cord, then you just stop, you know, because worst case scenario, you can go on the other side and, and, and do it from the other side or just abort and you, so that patient needs an ACDF. You're not burning any bridges. Um, so that's, I, I, that's a great point about not burning bridges. I think a lot of times when I have some of these patients, you know, I give them all the options and I, and I tell them about the longevity of, you know, a, a posterior cervical pharmacotomy versus a disc replacement versus ACDF. And you, know, you can always do a posterior cervical procedure and you, you don't burn a bridge. And I think you can, you can, you know, if it was me, I'd probably want that before I get an ACDF or, or a disc replacement. Absolutely. And uh, one thing I think it's important to mention for, for anyone who's going to plan on doing cervical procedures, let's talk about the pump setting and you know what's the water pressure because that can be an issue yeah I've seen the cervical spine especially you want to always be conscious of um, of you know the level of pressure that you're applying so um, I started 30s and I'll, I'll, I'll usually just kind of um, wait to see how it's how it's going if I if I'm getting a lot of bleeding I'll temporarily raise it so uh, so, Lynn, in the, you know, we're kind of uh, in the interest of time, why don't we just, uh, you know, show the audience, you, you, you very nicely, uh, you know, showed the, the pedicle that you're on right now, and I think you're trying to follow the exiting nerve root there right now, so that we're starting to see here a little bit more. Um, in the interest of time, I think people will get to slowly get ready for the lab, and then... Yeah, we, we can, can do this in the lab. We can, we can follow the nerve. You can follow the nerve out uh, very far. We can do that in the lab. We can follow it out. Uh, you know, the nice thing about this, you look, turn the camera around, look all the way out the neural frame, and you can um, visualize the nerve really nicely. So we can do that in the lab. And uh, I think that we're going to have a little break um, where you guys can, uh, the food's not here yet, but you guys can have coffee and snacks um, and while they get the lab ready for the hands-on. And um, I guess one last thing is, you know, you t turn the camera out laterally. One thing that I like to do sometimes is I like to kind of stand on the other side of the table and, and have my endoscope pointed at the frame. And that makes it really easy for me to go out, the, you know, go as far lateral as I can. It's just more ergonomic. I don't know if you guys ever tried that. I have not tried that, but I will give it a try. Mm -hmm. that's, go, that's, that's great. Guys, go for a break. All right, we're good. Uh, this is a break. And then, uh, thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you all.